Hello everyone and welcome back to the halfway point of the 2018 Small Farms Winter Webinar Series hosted by the University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farm Team. This is Zach Grant back again to moderate and I want to thank my colleague Doug Gucker for filling in for me last week. We really appreciate you joining us once again for these webinars and we're going to do our best to begin uh, within the space of this lunch hour. Again, this is a very tight delivery period for our educators to deliver their program, so please understand that we're going to limit your questions to the text box at the left during the presentation. I'm going to do my best to make sure our presenters answer them as time allows or provide you with links if necessary. I, have po I will post the call-in information in the chat box if you continue to have any audio or video issues. And additionally, you should have received the, the protected slide set for today's webinar in, in one of my last two emails. There is a chance that if you have limited internet bandwidth, you will have either audio or slide visual problems. Sometimes audio problems might occur if you do not have an audio device on your computer or you do not have an audio source, source connected. Try right-clicking on your speaker icon, usually in your bottom toolbar, to see what playback device you have connected. But do remember, this presentation will be recorded, and I will email a link to the archive presentation as soon as possible after this concludes. So if we run over on time and you need to leave a little early, you will receive an email link to the recorded webinar. There will also be a very short online evaluation for this presentation, and we would appreciate your feedback for future webinars and possibly future research projects. This week's presentation is from Dr. Andrew Margnott. He is one of our newest faculty members in the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. He's primarily focusing on urban, para-urban ag systems and soil systems specifically. He comes to us from his postdoc work and PhD work at the University of California, Davis. His work advances how we monitor and manage soils as natural capital. His larger research is putting together um, how human activities can enhance or compromise soil services to human societies, with an emphasis on the food security of urban and rural agroecosystems in the U.S. Midwest and East Africa. Andrew and I ha actually have been working closely together since he started with the University of Illinois on delivering a new low-cost heavy metal screening methodology to urban and para-urban growers. One of the primary missions of Extension is to bridge the gap between faculty research on campus with farmers, growers, and stakeholders in the field who knew that, need that information. This new collaboration really exemplifies that mission, and I could not be more excited. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Nott will explain that project plus much, much more. So with that, I'll go ahead and let him take it away. Thanks, Andrew. Sure. Zach, thank you for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Andrew, and I'm uh, glad to be able to talk to you all about heavy metals and soils. So uh, my goal for this webinar is for you to come out of here understanding some principles about heavy metals and soils, so kind of a one-on-one deal. What are they and why are they, why are they in soils? Um, and why is that a problem perhaps? And then second, I want us to talk about action. What are things that we can do to identify if there's a problem when it comes to heavy metals and soils? And if there's a suspected or a known contamination risk, what do we do? How do we act on that? And what are ways that are cost effective and evidence-based? Also, what are ways that are maybe not so well supported by the current evidence that we might want to avoid investing time and money in? So to start, um, you're probably looking at this photo in the background, and here's that in more detail. This is um, a portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, so PXRF. And my goal is that at the end of this presentation, you'll know uh, what that is, and you'll also know how to interpret the numbers on the screen. So if you look right here on my pointer, PB, that's the elemental symbol for lead, from Latin for plumbing, because it was used for piping. So PB lead is about uh, 2100 part per million or ppm. Um, and I hope that, well, if you don't know if, if that number is high or low, hopefully by the end of this, you'll know what it means. And you also have some ideas of things that you could do to address that potential risk. So heavy metals have been in the spotlight. They're having a bit of a moment um, for a couple different reasons, and they're on both global and national stages. Um, so for example, five years ago, there was a New York Times piece about soil contamination in China, and it was 
Talking more about peri-urban agriculture as shown in this photo, an idea is that the presence of manufacturing seen here in the background can contribute to deposition of contaminants, things like arsenic or lead. And that can be a risk to the farmers and also to, to the consumers of that produce. And I think one reason why um, heavy metals are more in the spotlight is that it's threatening chocolate, which of course most people get pretty worked up about. I do at least. And uh, there's increasing evidence that from some parts of the world, especially in South America, that uh, cacao beans are taking up cadmium, a type of heavy metal. And uh, it's getting to the point that the EU is going to begin to ban certain imports of cacao beans based on a maximum threshold of cadmium. Now that said, I want to emphasize that heavy metals are not just an issue for developing nations. We have it in this country as well. And it happens both in urban but also in non-urban spaces. So think about the salad bowl of California and Salinas Valley. They have an issue with cadmium uptake by spinach. Uh, so these are some sort of context framing points that I wish to make, that heavy metals are ubiquitous. They're in both rural and urban systems, and they're in most countries. So we're going to focus on the U.S. and in the next 40 minutes, I want us to think about the following uh, objectives. So first, I want to talk to you about what are heavy metals. And then two questions that are layered into that are, OK, so uh, what is the risk? Why should I care about there possibly being heavy metals like lead or cadmium in my soils? And second, um, why are they there? And knowing why heavy metals end up in soils can help you predict the possibility of them being there. From that, I, I want us to then talk about more action points. So what do you do to find out if there are uh, things like lead or arsenic present in your soils? And if you find out that there is a risk, or even if, for example, you can't afford to test, if you suspect that there might be a risk, what might you do to mitigate that risk? So ways to mitigate risk will be the main focus of the second half. Okay, so let's start with uh, some principles of heavy metals. What are they? Um, some of you might think about the genre of music, but really heavy metals are, um, by definition, just very dense elements, as the name uh, might imply. And specifically, they're about five times more dense than water. So by that very strict chemical definition, there are 17 elements that qualify as being heavy metals. And there's about, you know, there's some overlap here between heavy metals and just metals. And the difference is that the heavy metals are more dense and they tend to be more problematic to human health. And I say 10 because it really depends on what element you're talking about. I just want to point out that the EPA has a list of top eight metals of concern. Not all of those are heavy, but most of them are. And the one that we're going to be focusing on today is lead, which is on the EPA's list here in the top right. And it's also, by definition, one of the classic heavy metals, PB. Again, from the Latin word plumbus, I believe, which is Latin for plumbing, because it was being used by the Romans to plumb in water. So there, there's a few points, I think, that are worth um, mentioning here. One is that a lot of these elements, or rather some of them, like copper and zinc you probably heard about as being nutrients for humans and for plants as well. And there's some of them that we don't ever have a need for in our bodies. So the, the point here is that some heavy metals are in fact useful to life forms. And this leads us to the second theme that the dose makes the poison. So I guarantee you that you ate all of these different metals this morning in your breakfast. They were just in such low concentrations that they don't pose a problem. And same goes for soils. Soils have every single element at some amount, and it might just be a couple of atoms, but they're still there. So what's important to keep in mind when discussing these you know, pretty powerful topics like arsenic and cadmium, things that sound scary, is that, well, all soils have them. The real question is, are they at such a concentration that they might pose a risk either to plants or to humans? So. To answer that question, we have to consider uh, different kinds of metals for their distinct effects on humans. 
again, we're going to be focusing on lead for two reasons. One is that lead is most studied. And second, lead is the most common heavy metal contaminant in residential soils, so backyards, gardens. If you're finding yourself gardening or farming near a a former um, industrial center, then lead might not be as common as other compounds like, say, cadmium or arsenic. But let's talk about lead. So lead, I think, is exemplary of heavy metals in that it, in that it poses a suite of harmful effects to the human body, again, at, at a sufficiently high concentration. So in the case of lead, um, there's things like behavioral changes, like increased aggression, uh, there's nausea, and there's also long-term effects, especially on children who are still developing. Um, and I think most notably is that it stunts not just physical growth, but also mental growth. So there is cause to be concerned about heavy metals because they can impact human health. Um, some metals are different in how they do that. So for example, cadmium tends to affect the kidney, like lead, but also sex organs. And as a result, it can lead to birth defects. Um, in the case of arsenic, that is also a carcinogen. So there's a distinct threat posed by that metal. <clears throat> now, we're talking about soils. And the whole focus here is that soils are a common um, repository shall we say, for all kinds of contaminants. And that includes things like heavy metals. And so when we think about the use of soils for recreation, things like playgrounds um, for your kids or for your dogs, but also for food production, for gardens, there's two main ways of thinking about risk. The first is an indirect exposure route. And that would be you're exposed to heavy metals via the food that you grow in it. And so in this example, by consumption of the carrot, which accumulated lead from the soil into its flesh, and then you consume it. A second exposure route is direct. And that, as it implies, is you directly inhale or somehow ingest soil particles that have the amount, or sorry, that have the um, heavy metal present. So oftentimes we hear a lot of talk about the uptake of metals by the vegetable crops that are being grown in soils with contamination. So that's the indirect route. But there's evidence that it's the direct route that's uh, of higher risk. And I think this makes sense because if you think about how much more heavy metal concentrations are in the soils themselves, there's a higher payload delivered in a few um, dust particles than in a lot of carrots. And we'll see some data down the road that basically it takes a lot of carrots to match the same dose of lead as if you ate a handful of soil or just a few you know, uh, bits of it, which kids do. Uh, and so for example, there was a study looking at lead in Boston garden soils by Clark et al. And uh, she concluded that the indirect exposure route of eating carrots that were grown in soils with lead was only about 3% of kids' daily exposure to lead, whereas the soil route was 82%. So that's a theme for the rest of this talk, is that we're going to be thinking about ways to mitigate the risk by reducing direct exposure from soil. So that's going to look like a lot of physical barriers, things like raised beds or surface covers, to reduce the risk via inhalation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about heavy metals. Um, why are they in soils? What are they doing there? As we've talked about, all soils have all the elements, including things like lead, and that's natural. The question is why there is accumulation or enrichment of things like lead above that background. And it comes down to metals are really useful for what we humans like to do. So our homes, our instruments from smartphones to cars, they all use metals for their properties. Um, lead, for example, has been used since before the ancient Romans. And for example, on the left panel here, there's a, uh, you know, the mining of lead was quite well, well, it was uh, well established by the 1500s. Um, and if you walk around to certain parts of Rome today, there's still areas that have the original lead pipes built by the Romans. And so I think this is somewhere in the east part of Rome, and there's a lead pipe that's probably, what, 4,000 years old? Um, and it's still there. So note the persistence of these heavy metals. That's the second theme to, to uh, keep in mind. Just like our bodies, in soils, once metals are there, they're really hard to get rid of. They're quite persistent. 
In this country, um, we have a legacy of lead deposition, which means that even though there's not that much new release of lead into soils, um, there's this leftover buildup from the former half of the last century, so from the early 1900s. And really, lead in soils in this country has two main sources. The first was paint. So as you have probably heard, lead was used in paint to make it well, more robust and also brighter. And that began to fall off by the 1930s with not much lead paint being used by the 1970s. However, there, there was still a total increase in lead usage uh, due to the use of uh, lead in gasoline. And that was banned, I think, beginning by the 1970s in some states and effectively by the 1990s, lead gas was over. But the idea is that uh, the total amount of lead that was released into the environment, especially in cities due to houses having paint and high traffic density, means that all this lead went somewhere. And oftentimes that somewhere is in the soil. Even if it was put out as exhaust from cars that eventually would deposit as, as an aerosol particle onto the surface of soils. So, there's been quite a legacy of heavy metal deposition in this country. Um, and shown here is the legacy of lead and only from gasoline-based sources in the US uh, from 1950 to 1982. And so basically the bigger the black circle, the more tons of lead were deposited in that metro region. And not surprisingly, the amount of lead that was uh, put out there uh, tracks quite well with population, and that has to do with more people and more cars. Uh, so for example, LA is first, followed by New York second, and then third, here we are in Chicago. So that's at the national scale. If we ask the question, well, in any of these different cities, where is the lead? It tends to track, or it tends to be found in what are called hot spots. Now these hot spots are less easy to predict because they're not just due to traffic. Again, gasoline was just one source of lead. Other sources include the paint from old housing stock, but also industry for which cities were once famous. Uh, so as a result, in places like New Orleans, there may be some places with high lead that don't, that don't necessarily track with the major traffic densities. And this could be due to, for example, the presence of a coal-fired plant or a smelting plant uh, back in the 1920s. But again, that lead is very persistent and it will stick around. There are, though, some themes that enable us to predict overall trends in where lead is in any urban environment. So the first is it tends to be more by buildings and by major roads relative to things like lawns and trees. So the increased amount of soil lead in proximity to a building makes sense because of the use of paint, um, sorry, the use of lead in paint. Uh, and the increase in lead with proximity to major traffic ways also makes way, uh, sorry, makes sense due to the former use of leaded gasoline. If we uh, zone in on this building trend, uh, there's different studies that show the same basic idea that as you go away from the roadside, within about five meters or 15 feet, the concentrations of lead in soil rapidly fall off. So this makes sense then that lawn should have less lead than near roadside because the gasoline did not make it, sorry, the lead from the gasoline did not make it that far out. Also, the proximity to a building as a good predictor of soil lead is also, I think, more true for the housing aid. So if you know also not, um, not just how far away your garden plot is from, say, a building, but the age of that building, it can give you some further insight into predicting the potential risk. And basically, structures that were around to receive leaded paint are at much higher risk of having soil lead nearby. So I've been talking about soil lead, but as you know, soils are three-dimensional. They go fairly deep. And especially for gardeners, we think about soil testing in the top foot or so. 
And evidence suggests that because this lead was being deposited from top down, so it's being deposited as an aerosol from gasoline or as paint chips or just from rainfall, that a lot of the lead is building up in topsoil. And it seems like the top six to eight inches is where, in general, most of lead is found in soils. Okay, so this is um, in some sense good because it, it allows one to excavate a surface soil and truck it out if there's severely high amounts of lead. On the other hand, it's also problematic because the deeper lead is more expensive to uh, vacate. And also plant roots can go deep so they can potentially tap into those lead reserves. One question that you might have is, well, Andrew, what the heck do these numbers mean, right? So we're looking at a lead concentration in part per million PPM from zero up to about 2,000. And a very good question is, what does that mean? How do I interpret these numbers? What is too much lead? Well, this is what the US EPA calls a threshold of action if there's bare soil and there are children present. So 400 part per million in, an, in a exposed soil is the threshold at which you need to do something. And that typically means cover up that bare soil, again, to reduce the pathway of direct exposure, meaning kids eating dirt, or if you're an urban farmer, as you till, breathing in those dust particles. Now, keep in mind that, you know, as I've said a few times now, all soils have all these metals, and on average, a soil in the U.S. has about 19 ppm. So 400 is about 20 times higher than the national average. Now, there's different countries and states that differ in their recommendation of how much lead is too much. So in California, it's 85 ppm. That's the, that is the limit for for uh, for bare soil, and in the Netherlands, it's the same, 85 ppm. I believe the lowest of any U.S. state is in Minnesota, which is 80 part per million. The EPA makes a distinction between the bare soil and then soil being used for vegetable production, and for that, they have it much higher at 1,200 ppm. The rationale here is that if you cover up that soil with, say, plastic or wood chip mulch, then there's a lower risk of exposure to you directly. And then the main exposure route is uptake by the plant, which is why that number is higher. And we'll discuss that in a few seconds, or minutes rather. Okay, now I think that there can be some confusion on the part of gardeners and even people that have kids, pets too, because think about dogs and cats, um, backyard chickens. There's some confusion with stakeholders on, well, what is a threshold of soil lead that is cause for concern? And I think a lot of that confusion comes from different state agencies having different criteria for what constitutes a high amount of soil lead. So for example, if you're in Minnesota, 300 ppm is classified as a high amount of lead in soil, whereas in Ohio, it's up to 3,000 that constitutes high. So there's not quite an agreement. I want to stress, though, that the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, has uh, conclusively decided that there's no safe amount of lead exposure, meaning that any amount of lead is harmful. And this goes not just for soils, it goes for things like tap water, it goes for the paint or the walls of your home. So from talking to stakeholders, my understanding is that there's lots of potential confusion. Um, there is not really a clearly defined standard. As we just saw, different states have different evaluations of what it is a high lead risk. And the EPA also explains that there's really no definitive standards yet for what constitutes a contamination level that's safe for food production. So again, that limit of 400 ppm, that's for kids playing in bare soil. What about producing food? And what about the differences between crops like root crops, which are in intimate contact with soils, versus things like leafy crops or fruit crops? And a lot of this just comes down to the fact that uh, the science is still developing, and it's not quite understood yet how soil lead total or available translates to uptake by the crop. That said, I think we can decide on some action points and also on some soil lead levels that are actionable. Um, so as uh, pointed out by Calvin and Hobbes, a foundational piece of graphic literature from my childhood, 
there sometimes you simply have to act. And I think because the CDC claims or uh, has found that there's no safe amount of lead, it makes sense to get tested for soil lead. And then unless you have basically background levels to think about ways of mitigating the risk of exposure. And again, we're thinking here of the two routes, indirect via the food crop and direct versus consumption of the soil. So the first step then is to find out. You need to find out if your soil has lead as well as um, other kinds of contaminants. So I'll say here that lead gets a lot of the attention when it comes to heavy metals. Uh, again, that's because it's been most studied. Uh, but you want to keep in mind, especially if you find yourself near a former industrial area, about other heavy metals like arsenic, uh, cobalt, cadmium, and zinc and or copper. So for example, uh, smelting operations tend to have lead and copper co-occurring. Um, there's also lots of rural farms that used lead arsenate as a pesticide in the early 20th century. So again, this is not just urban soils that may have high amounts of heavy metals. So when you're thinking about finding out and getting tested, we should make a distinction between testing and screening. So to test for lead, one has to go to an EPA certified lab and you go through a very, well, the soil sample rather goes through a very thorough process in which you get definitive quantitative data. And not surprisingly, this costs time and money. Um, it, it's hard to find out exactly how much lead. So that's testing, more expensive, but more definitive. Screening is a trade-off between uh, accuracy and speed and cost. So in general, screening means that you're doing a high through a high throughput technique like portable x-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, basically a Star Trek-like handheld x-ray gun that you saw in the opening slide. So XRF is a way that uses x-rays to semi-quantitatively determine the amount of any element, be it a metal or not, in acquisition times as quick as 30 seconds. So once you put down the 50,000 bucks for the XRF, then it's pretty much free to pull the trigger and in 30 seconds, the sample of interest you get a reading on for lead, cadmium, arsenic, etc. Now again, it's semi-quantitative, so there's a bigger margin of measurement error than something like an EPA certified test. But as a quick and dirty initial step to see if you should do further testing, screening can be a good option. And I think that this is especially the case in urban soils. Because of the different sources of things like lead, we might find hot spots of lead deposition in soils at a scale within a typical garden plot or a lawn. So shown here, for example, are two garden plots uh, from Boston and from Kansas City, and they're heat maps with red showing more lead. And what it shows is that on the scale of about, well, this is, uh, let's say, 40 meters um, by 40 meters in the Boston plot, at that scale alone, there can be drastic differences in the concentrations of topsoil lead. If you think about how much a soil test for lead costs, up to 60 bucks sometimes, and if you're doing a composite sample, so you're sampling here, 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 and here, the average value might be misleading when it comes to certain parts of the garden having very high amounts. And this is a case where screening on site with something like XRF can be useful because you can find out where in your lawn or garden or farm is there a buildup of lead. So once you've identified, or if you can't afford to test, once you suspect, for example, the historical land use, once you suspect that there might be contamination by lead, arsenic, etc., the next step is to think about, well, how can I mitigate the risk of myself as the urban farmer or gardener and that of the users of the land like kids or pets um, and or the consumers of any produce being grown in those soils? So I'll say that there's a couple of themes that we need to keep in mind before we discuss ways to remove or to mitigate heavy metals in soils. The first is that metals don't decompose. So, for example, there are organic-based contaminants, things like um, 
benzene, which microbes can degrade for us. And over time, they go away. Uh, but metals are metals. They're elements. And unless you are the Big Bang, you cannot make or change them. And so metals will persist. And furthermore, they're really good at binding to organic matter, clays, soils. So heavy metals also persist, and they don't really move. So they're not very good at leaching away over time. For this reason, they tend to stick around, and they can be remobilized by wind. So oftentimes, if you have, for example, a raised bed, if there's nearby exposed soil, you'll get redepositioned by wind of the nearby soil lead on top of the raised bed. And we'll talk about that a few slides down. As a result, the most effective treatment is to get rid of soil if you know you have a high concentration of lead. So for example, above 400 ppm. This is expensive because soils are heavy. One cubic yard is about 1.5 metric tons of weight. Also the labor involved in getting rid of that mass. So a lot of people aren't able to afford that. Or in some cases, you may have a amount of lead, maybe a couple hundred, but below that 400 ppm threshold, which may not be cause for concern, but you still want to mitigate risk just to be safe. So in these cases, we have options that are called remediation or mitigation, trying to lessen the susceptibility of yourself or those that consume your products to the lead in your soil. Now, I'm going to be focusing on in situ, in which you keep the soil in place and you do things to it, like mulching, adding phosphorus, as a way to decrease the availability of that lead. I'll say that a different approach is ex situ. So you truck the soil off site, effectively it gets washed with chelators, and then they truck it back. Now that might be as expensive as just simply taking off and excavating all the soil and bringing in fresh soil, but it can be done, just so you're aware. So note that I'm not talking about phytoremediation when I'm discussing in situ. And I want to bring this up because phytoremediation is a popular concept and it has had some use for specific contaminants like uranium in the former Chernobyl site. When it comes to more ubiquitous metals like lead, I, it seems like its benefits may not be fully understood and or difficult to realize. And this has to do with the fact that plants don't take up, or rather most food plants, uh, don't take up that much lead. Um, and there's a concept called the bioaccumulation or bioconcentration factor. So that is the ratio of lead concentration taken up by the plant on the y-axis over the concentration of soil lead. And so in some sense, it's a percent of the concentration of total soil lead that was taken up by the crop lead, sorry, by the crop. In this case, the factor is about 0.02. So about 2% of the concentration in the soil translates to the concentration in the plant tissues. And that's not that high. So here we have what, uh, what I like to think of as the double-edged sword or two sides of the same coin. For the same reason that a lot of food crops don't take up very high amounts of lead relative to how much is in the soil, that also means that most plants won't be able to take up or sponge up enough lead for phytoremediation to be a useful option, simply because the plants aren't taking up, sorry, the plants aren't taking up enough to make a dent in a soil with a high amount of lead. To get a, a little bit more concrete with you, here's one example. It's not with lead, it's with zinc. But if you look at a soil that has a thousand ppm zinc, and you want to get it down to 50 ppm zinc, if you use plants that are not hyper accumulators, meaning most plants, um, if the plants take up a low amount of the total soil zinc per crop, it can take you on the order of centuries to millennia to go down from the 1,000 to the 50 ppm target. Now, there are some crop species that can hyperaccumulate. Um, and so there's ongoing research on trying to identify or even breed for these species. So 
For that reason, we should not dismiss phytoremediation as an option. But for now, it seems like, especially for things like lead, there are limited effective options that are known. So let's talk about what is known. Things that you can do that science has established are somewhat effective at mitigating metal risk. Again, both to you by inhaling or to the crop by their uptake and then you eating that crop. So the first is you increase soil pH. Um, the availability of heavy metals depends on pH. In general, as the pH goes up, they're less available. A second option is to bind up those metals with a binding partner. And in that case, it would be phosphate is quite effective. Third one would be to use a organic matter input like compost. And compost, it appears, is emerging as an effective way to mitigate the availability of heavy metals like lead in soils. And finally, we'll talk about some off-touted options that are emerging, but as you'll see, I think there's still more research needed to identify specific contexts in which things like biochar, zeolite, would be useful to in situ immobilize, in other words, to decrease availability of these metals. So the first one, pH. As we probably know, pH is the master uh, variable of soils. If you, if you toggle that switch, everything changes, for better or for worse. And in the case of heavy metals, we can leverage pH to our advantage if the main goal is to, re, is to uh, tamp down the amount of metals that are available for plant uptake. And this is simply because most metals shown here, and ex uh, I think lead is right here, actually. Yeah, so there's the curve for lead. The solubility curve for most metals tends to decrease as pH goes up. So what that means is that as you increase soil pH from, say, 6.5 up to 8, up to 9, most metals will precipitate out. They're no longer soluble and thus available for plant uptake. And there is increasing evidence that the precipitates, if you ingest it, are not readily dissolved by stomach acid. So there might be benefits to this approach to, to reducing the direct exposure route. However, that's ongoing research, and we're not quite sure about that yet. As, as you probably all have some experience with soil fertility and gardening, you are perhaps thinking that there's a bit of a trade-off here, especially if we're talking about lining up from pH 6 to pH 9. Well, that's going to have impacts on overall soil fertility. And um, metals are no different from other plant elements, uh, or, or rather nutrient ones. So for example, as we increase pH, we get drastic changes in the availability of things like nitrogen and phosphorus um, and calcium. So there's some collateral damage being done to the availability of the good elements that we want available for plants. Um, so that, in that sense, the idea of lining up from, say, pH 6.5 to 9 all the way or just to mitigate, say, a lead issue, that only makes sense if there's a lot of lead, hundreds of ppm, even thousands. And in that case, uh, we might be willing to take a hit to fertility in order to tamp down the availability of that contaminant. A second approach that has less uh, collateral damage would be adding phosphorus. So as shown here in this equation, uh, phosphate, as in triple superphosphate, single super phosphate, it's a very good binding partner of heavy metals like lead and also things like cadmium. And so if they find themselves together in the same soil, they will combine and make a precipitate, basically a solid that is unavailable for plant uptake. Not just the phosphate, but also that lead. So you're using phosphate as a martyr compound to tie up that lead. Uh, and there's plenty of studies, like this one shown here, that looks at different sources of phosphorus, from phosphate rock to triple superphosphate. And what we find is that, in general, by adding some kind of phosphorus, we get a decrease in the amount of physiologically available lead, the, B, the PBET lead. Um, and these decreases can be significant. So we see a decrease from about an average of 25 um, ppm down to about 15. So not quite 50%, but in the 40%. And that's meaningful. Now, 
That said, this often might require adding a lot of phosphorus, and that has implications for things like water quality. So for example, this study found that if you add triple superphosphate on a 5% mass basis, you could decrease the amount of bioavailable lead from 60 to 40%. That's about a one-third decrease. But think about the cost, not just economic, of buying all of that phosphorus. It's also a environmental cost, because that's a very high P application rate likely to result in phosphorus runoff and leaching, which has implications for water quality. So there's trade-offs for, e for each of these approaches, as you're probably uh, picking up on. And I think this uh, image integrates both the pH effect with lime with the phosphate approach. Uh, this was a study done by Nicholas Basta, a professor at Ohio State, and what he suggested, or what his data suggests rather, is that if you've got soils with very high amounts of cadmium and lead contamination, and we're talking thousands of ppm, that increasing the pH from 6.4 to maybe not as high as 9, but even just 7.6 to 7.8, that can be very effective in at least enabling plant growth. So um, I'm not showing here data for the availability of that soil lead, but this is evidence that even a minor pH increase can be more effective than adding, for example, a phosphate source. Um, now that said, the amount of amendment that was added is pretty high. Um, on a 10% mass basis, again, soil is heavy, right? One cubic yard is um, 1.5 metric tons. Adding a amendment like phosphate rock at a 10% mass basis is something like 90 tons per acre to a six inch depth. So these are very input intensive approaches to remediate soils with heavy metals. Let's talk about a amendment that might be more affordable and also more effective at lower rates. And it's also being used currently by lots of backyard and urban farmers. So that would be compost. Um, so compost is organic matter, and a lot of heavy metals, especially lead, have a, have a high affinity to binding to organic matter. So or, um, organic matter can effectively act as a sponge and uh, tie up these metals, reducing how mobile and thus how available they are for crop uptake. Again, there's not too much evidence or not too much is known about the other direct exposure route of what happens if you inhale soil with lead, even though it might have compost. We're not quite sure yet. But in terms of reducing the uptake by crops, it seems like compost is generally beneficial. So if you look at these three different crops of chard, tomato, and carrot, in general, the soils that receive compost have a lower amount of lead in the edible portions of these three different crops. So compost versus no compost. And it seems to have a different effect depending on the crop type. So we see a bigger positive benefit for chard compared to say carrot. Which brings us to our next point. Different kinds of crop species have different edible portions that might be at higher risk for containing lead, either because it's inside of the cells or it's on the surface. As you might imagine, root crops, which are in intimate contact with soils, are probably at the greatest risk for having a payload of a heavy metal like lead. And this data bears this out, where carrot has, in general, higher lead concentrations than a leafy green, which in turn has higher concentrations of lead than fruits. This is a oft-repeated um, rule of thumb, and the evidence does support it, that if you're trying to avoid the indirect exposure route, it's best to grow fruits, maybe greens, and to avoid root vegetables as much as possible. Some people suggest that peeling root vegetables uh, might be effective to, as a way to decrease the amount of lead that was just bound to the surface. And it seems like this can be done, but under realistic conditions, so kitchen cleaning, not in a lab, in other words, what most people do in their homes, the contribution of washing and peeling to decreasing the, the lead load in a root crop is not that marked. Um, so really, avoidance of root crops is probably a better thing to follow. 
A organic matter input besides compost that has been getting lots of attention quite recently is that of biochar, also uh, quite similar to activated carbon. So biochar, there's a different or there's multiple mechanisms by which we think biochar could potentially decrease the availability of heavy metals like lead. And this diagram depicts them quite nicely. So there are things like directly binding and thus locking up those heavy metals. Um, also things like uh, swapping out different ions. So exchanging a lead atom for a calcium one contained in the biochar. Now these are mechanisms and one thing is mechanisms and, and hypothesized modes of action. Another thing is knowing that biochar can effectively and consistently provide benefits to stakeholders who want to decrease lead availability. Now in that question, the jury is still out. And I think that this is for a few reasons. But the main one is that there's no such thing as biochar. There's just different kinds of biochars. And that's important to keep in mind because biochars, depending on the feedstock and on how you make it, they can vary drastically in their properties, including the properties that would make them more or less effective at binding up heavy metals like lead. Also, biochars are not exactly, um, well, they may present their own contaminant risk. If you think about it, they're effectively like charcoal um, or like coal in their chemistry. And as we know from coal, uh, there are potentially carcinogenic compounds in these aromatic type surfaces. And so it should be important to keep in mind that there's also ongoing research on the risk of using a high amount of biochar, especially of fine particle size in one's soils. Finally, if biochar does bind up like compost, things like lead, what happens as the compost or the biochar decomposes over time? Will it re-release what it previously was binding up? So there's some temporal questions on how effective this is. Given that, it seems like physical barriers are the best way to mitigate your risk to heavy metals and soils. And this is also because, again, the main exposure pathway is direct. It's your uh, inhalation of dust particles that carry a payload of lead that is more likely to produce a health risk than consumption of leaf or fruit vegetables. So for that, we've got different options on how to effectively stop the pathway from soil to your body. And I wanted to go over a few of them, but I, I want to point out that raised beds are the most commonly proposed mechanism. And that's what's pictured here. The idea is to put the root crops out of reach of the soil, but also think about yourself. You're also out of reach. You're further away in proximity from the soil surface, especially if you've got a cover like grass. There are other kinds of barriers, though. So probably the most effective one and cheapest would be mulching. And mulching can be something like wood chips, but it can also be plastic. And that is pretty much a, a total coverage of the soil as a means to mitigate the inhalation or even just the skin to soil contact that could cause eventual uptake of the metals into your body. Um, well, I just grouped these two together, but mulching with wood chips, but also a mulching with plastic as a impervious layer. Of course, as with, as with most things in agriculture and in life, there are trade-offs here. So just to give an example, the mulch from wood chips will degrade over time, and that may be a cost over years. And things like a impervious layer, be it on the surface or subsurface, that will produce uh, constraints to root growth or to water availability or both. Raised beds has been proposed as a method, but it's also a bit more expensive because you have to construct these uh, structures and then you have to fill them up with, with some kind of a substrate. And unless that substrate, that soil and or compost um, is from a different site, it may not actually alleviate risk. Also, it's important to note that raised beds may not be a long-term solution for two reasons. One is that roots can go deep and get into the soil. And perhaps more importantly is that wind can remobilize lead nearby. And that doesn't just mean lead nearby in the same garden or yard. It could mean lead from the nearby freeway five miles away. 
Um, and there are studies indicating that long-term transport of lead in dust particles can cause raised beds to return to the original soil amounts of lead. So um, I'll say that there's some evidence suggesting that raised beds can be effective, and that's because these studies measure the amount of lead in the raised bed versus no beds immediately after making that raised bed, before there's time for the wind to redeposit lead on the surface. If we look at studies that examine raised beds and soil lead over longer time frames, it seems that on the span of years, in this case four years, there's eventual recontamination of the soil in the raised bed due to wind. Um, this study got into this mechanism by using isotopes, and basically they found that the soil in the raised bed showed a signature of lead that was both the contaminant soil nearby and then the compost that was used to make up the raised bed. Since the compost doesn't have that much lead relative to titanium, the source of that raised bed lead had to have been from that nearby soil. So this study suggested that raised beds should not be seen as a permanent way to remediate soils. It's just putting off the exposure risk. This study was over a course of four years. So to summarize, uh, I hope I've given you an introduction to heavy metals and soils. And my goal has been to explain sort of the fundamentals of what's up with heavy metals. Uh, what are they? Why should I be concerned? And I think we should be, especially for things like lead. And then also, why are they there? Now, the why are they there often can be frustrating because, as we've seen, there's a legacy of contamination that frustrates the best solution. Because, of course, as with, as with most things in life, prevention is the best strategy. But because of this historical deposition from leaded gas and leaded paint, it's oftentimes not possible to prevent. Also think about wind transporting dust from a nearby site. It's very difficult to prevent that. So with that in mind, it's always a good thing to get tested, especially if you live in an urban center or maybe not in an urban center, but nearby a place that had manufacturing or industry. So again, get tested or at least get screened with something like XRF, which tends to be cheaper, as a way to understand if you're at risk. And if you know that you're at risk because of testing or screening, or if you suspect because of, say, land use history that there might be a risk, it's always a good idea to do some things that can integrate into your uh, current practices. So replacing soil is the best solution, but that's expensive. There's ways to mitigate that would dovetail nicely with current gardening practices. And it seems like composting, or adding compost rather, might be the most effective way. Other proven methods, as we've discussed, are lining and adding phosphorus. Uh, keeping your soil at a pH of 7677 might be the best way to reduce toxicity to plants, but it seems like a lot of lime and a lot of phosphate is needed to really put a dent in the availability of lead. And that just may not be economical or just downright undesirable for your gardening goals and environmental quality. I want to point out, though, that though we've been discussing about soil-centric approaches, there are best management practices, BMPs, outside of gardening uh, or outside of soil inputs that can still be beneficial for you to follow if you think you might have a problem with heavy metals. The first one is try to minimize contact, and this means also washing your hands and clothes after gardening or farming, um, especially for kids. It seems like a lot of the household dust with lead is due to soil being tracked inside. So that might be a very roundabout way of being exposed to lead. Um, trying to reduce the amount of dust by avoiding tillage during a dry part of the year uh, and also bare patches of soil is probably a good overall practice if you think you might have a, a contamination issue. Again, trying to minimize direct contact of human or pet bodies or even livestock bodies like backyard chickens. Avoiding root crops, uh, it seems like leaf and even more preferably fruit crops are the best options. And finally, if you do grow root crops, make sure to wash and peel them. Though again, avoiding them is probably a better idea. So with that, I'll, I'd like to um, point out that 
I've been talking about screening as a lower cost option. Um, my lab is partnering with uh, U of I Extension with Zach Grant to offer a soil screening service. The first event kicks off this weekend, but we have a big event on March 24th at the Good Food Commons in Chicago at the USC Forum. The basic idea is that you bring in a soil sample and if it's dry and if we have the address, then we can screen it on site. Because XRF is quick, 30 seconds, we can tell you on the spot more or less how much lead is there. And that can give you information with which you can decide to follow up with EPA certified testing. We also can give you data on other metals besides lead that might be overlooked or are too costly to screen for. So I mentioned that, the, that we would like for you to uh, provide the sample location, and that's because we're trying to build a library of soils that are geospatially defined, meaning we know where they are, in order to construct maps of where soil heavy metals are, but also the better soils are in Chicago. Like you saw for the map of New Orleans, our goal is to develop a, a metro-wide map for the Chicago area in order to provide information for gardeners, farmers, and also policymakers to understand what are the risks to stakeholders when it comes to things like lead. So with that, um, you can check out my Twitter for more information on how to sample for these screening events. Um, AJ Marginot is my handle. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions on soils and heavy metals. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really, really, really great and awesome to verify a lot of the things that I've been teaching my urban farmers are, are actually true in looking at the data that you presented. So thank you so much for that. Um, we, do have, we do have quite a few questions, and I had a couple prompts that I wanted to bring up, but we'll get to the, the questions uh, from the participants first. And again, if anyone needs to hop off the call, we're going to record this Q&A session as well, and you can pick up uh, where, we, where you leave off if you have to get off the call. So the, the first question that, j that just popped up here at the end um, was someone asked a question about uh, dust. Do farmers have more heavy metals in their body because of dust? I said I think it depends. I mean, particularly, obviously, if you're working farming in urban settings and you're accumulating it through inhalation of dust, is there any data or anything you've seen that would indicate that that's the case? Not specifically with farmers, but there's a lot of good work coming out um, from Indiana by Dr. Filippi, who's trying to link blood lead levels in children with soil lead and that has not been done for farmers but it has been done for urban citizens and it seems like in some cases soil lead can explain blood lead in children uh, but not always and the idea is that um, there's other sources of lead exposure right and other kinds of heavy metals uh, and same would go for farmers so a lot of pesticides use things like arsenate or they did at least so uh, it may not just be a soil question, it might also be um, other parts of the work in home place. I think it's a great question, especially if you're looking at urban farmers, if they're potentially at greater risk for some of these things. Okay. Um, so a question just popped up, but let me get to the one that I just had on my mind. Someone asked the question about using genetically modified plants or transgenic plants that um, might mitigate uptake from the soil. Is there any work being being done uh, in, in that space for specialty crops or other other crops where it might be relevant? I believe so, and there's almost two ways of thinking about, well, first, uh, it's a great question, and I believe so that there's work going on. And it might be thought of as two ways. You could breed crops to be less vulnerable to take them up, and also in the case of phytoremediation, you could also breed, um, you know, like catch crops, as a way to accumulate and sponge up these metals. And I am not an expert on this, but I believe that there's ongoing work in the realm of plant breeding to provide these tools. Okay, awesome. So there's another question that, well, there's a few that are coming in now. Um, and some of them may or may not be related to uh, lead uh, uptake specifically, but someone asked a question about using waste wallboard for gypsum content to amend clay soils. I think gypsum would bring drive the pH down, but have you heard of anything, or is that, uh, I'm not sure if that necessarily directly relates to heavy metal uptake, but do you have any comment about that? Sure, yeah. So um, gypsum might be useful because of the calcium as a binding partner. So calcium sulfate, I believe, is gypsum. And um, 
Calcium is a binding partner uh, for some anionic forms, so think of arsenate. Even though it's a metal, it occurs as a minus charged particle. That might be useful. Um, I think in the end, the benefits of lime are not so much from the calcium, it's from the pH effect. Uh, so gypsum, I don't know enough, but I would think if you're thinking about it as an amendment to mitigate metals by pH, lime would be a better option. Okay. Um, so two questions that just came in. One is about the requirement for commodity farms to have soil tested in high-risk areas. Actually, Zach, um, I just realized that the question about gypsum, I misinterpreted. So they're asking about reusing a waste yeah. source. Um, yeah. That's a great question. So I think for that, the best thing to do is to screen it for lead um, with XRF or just to run a test on it. Oh. And it would depend on where that wall was, right? If it's inside of a factory that processes or uh, you know works with metals, then I would probably not use that because of the dust buildup. Right. So that's a good point. If they were asking if if there is some potential contamination of the wallboard for even because you're using it for the gypsum in, in the wallboard. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So someone did have the question about uh, commodity crop farms. Um, to have their uh, soils tested in high-risk areas, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. I don't think there was a requirement, but I mean maybe that would still um, you'd still maybe want to look at, at testing if if you thought you were in a high-risk area. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not aware of any requirements. Um, I know that a lot of the requirements for testing commodity crops are ones that are imported, like spices and soon-to-be cacao in California and in the EU. In terms of domestically produced crops, um, I don't know if that exists. I'm not an expert on EPA or FDA regulations. Okay. Yeah, and, and from, well, commodity cro crops aren't, in terms of the Food Safety Modernization Act, there isn't, it doesn't really uh, cover commodity crops specifically, and there's nothing really in heavy metals about that. So, um, but I could, if you have more questions about that, that doesn't answer your question, I can uh, follow up with an email. Someone asked a question about Milo granite. Uh, contains, does it, he's heard it's cre uh, contains heavy metals. Is there a potential concern with using Milo granite or similar sludge based fertilizers? Also, is there an issue with seaweed based fertilizers? Sure. Um, so I think that this dovetails with the previous question about testing soils for commodity farms. I know that when it comes to sludge use, there are some testing requirements on the amount of heavy metal payloads in the sludge itself. So the EPA has got quite a few resources on this, and it's not just for lead, it's for things like chromium and arsenic, and in general, uh, most EPA certified um, guidelines or the sludges that have been certified for quality um, have a maximum heavy metal threshold that because you're adding it to soil, you're diluting it out. And so the topic of, su of sewage slud has, excuse me, sewage sludge has been researched pretty well at uh, Virginia Tech. And the consensus appears to be that if you're getting certified sludge, once you incorporate it, the dilution effect is such that the final soil concentration is not a big concern. Okay, excellent. And I want to—I apologize. Some people had asked some questions earlier, and a, a bunch of them just came on quickly. So sure. let me get back to an original question someone had about um, about issues with irrigating from city water that may contain heavy metals in terms of recontaminating. I could think of a good example: the lead-contaminated water in Flint. Um, would there be an issue of using that irrigation water and concern about accumulating lead levels in soil with that water? That's a great question, and I don't think that has been looked at. Um, you might think that if there's enough lead, it might be pretty trace, part per million or part per billion in the irrigation water. That could add up. I know that the use of wastewater for irrigation in developing nations is quite common. It might also be not intentional, but you, but there might be wastewater, like storm drain water in urban areas that could be a source of water-based heavy metals. Um, in general, though, I think most tap water in the U.S., is dilute enough that you would have to add a lot of that water. So maybe over the course of years, it could be an issue. Um, and that raises the, the, the importance of getting tested for your irrigation water, um, as well as the, the sewage sludge, as was raised earlier. And on that note, too, um, somebody asked about the fertilizers, like, say, seaweed. Um, the main source of fertilizer contamination of soils with heavy metals typically tends to be things based on guano or um, 
uh, Chilean nitrate or triple superphosphate. And that has to do with the fact that a lot of these, well, all those inputs are based on poop. They're bird poop or bat poop. Um, and animals are good at accumulating heavy metals. That's why sludge is an issue, right? Because it's human poop. When it comes to things like guano and phosphates, that's um, seabird poop that's been mined. And it's notoriously high in cadmium. So a lot of issues people think with cadmium uptake by cacao, by spinach, and South America and California is in part due to the high application of phosphate fertilizers containing cadmium. And it seems like the phosphate rock followed by the triple superphosphate are at greatest risk. In terms of things like seaweed, I'm not familiar with that, but um, again, I would get tested. Test the actual compost, the actual fertilizer that you're using. And a lot of fertilizers have uh, certificates of conformance from the companies that actually do test the levels of heavy metals in the fertilizers they're selling. So you can ask the company about that um, as another reference point. And really quickly, I wanted someone, I, I don't want to uh, hold their time if they, if they have to get off. Someone had a question about, I, I said I don't think so, but I wanted to ask anyway about any characteristics of soil, texture, color, dry out, exceptionally fast that are suggestive of contamination? Can you answer mm -hmm. that definitively? I, I said I didn't think so, but I, I wanted to make sure. I would agree with you, Zach. Um, and so heavy metals are, uh, you know, the reason why they're a threat is that they can be harmful at very low concentrations. We're talking part per million. Um, and that's, for example, the size of the microbiomass in your soil is maybe a couple hundred part per million, and you can't see that. And for the same reason, metals, there's no real color or texture effect that's evident at the levels at which you would have cause for concern. So 400 ppm lead, not much is going to tip you off just by examination, unfortunately for us, because that means that we have to do more expensive ways of testing. I would say at the levels at which you would notice coloration or textural effects or even you know burning of your fingers, uh, you probably have severely high contamination. Mm -hmm. And that would be where the metals are in a percent mass, you know, right. and that would be 10,000 ppm. Okay. Yeah. Well, one other question on here before I get to the questions I had, um, which sure. again, I mean, some people are off the call now, which is fine, but I want to capture all of this uh, exchange. Someone had the question about uh, radon uh, uptake with crops. It's a, I know it's a, it's more of a concern with uh, radon in, uh, home, in people's homes, but have you heard of anything or uh, familiar with radon issues with crops or any other radioactive um, uh, geological material as affecting crops? Sure. Well, um, I think there's two things there. One is the radioactive issue. The separate one is that radon is a gas, so it's pretty mobile and it tends to accumulate in low uh, depressional points, hence basements. And I, I've never heard of that for, for crop production. Um, that's not to say that it may not be an issue. I'm thinking here of, say, root crops, maybe. If they're subsurface, they could be exposed. Um, I believe that the main risk of radon is that you inhale it. So when it comes to things like root crops, um, just thinking out loud here, I don't know if that would be a risk. Okay. Um, that said, I think what's important to keep in mind about radon is that it's geogenic. So it's not anthropogenic. It's geologically occurring. And a lot of these heavy metals like cadmium and, and, and arsenic, um, in certain parts of the country, like in New Mexico and Maine, it's naturally there in the soil at high amounts that might be cause for concern. Hmm. Um, in terms of the radioactive risk, Typically, that's if you've got fallout from a nuclear plant or even bomb testing. So, for example, in, in Fukushima, in that agricultural region, in this country, I'm not aware of any risks um, when it comes to radioactive elements. Okay. Um, so, one of the follow-ups to the irrigation question, and I'll include this when we send out the email. I, I'm fairly certain I've seen just one study, and it was, I think, a very small study particular in Flint after the um, contamination of the city's water supply, looking at if there was accumulation in raised beds after utilizing that water. And I want to say that there wasn't a significant difference between the two, but I'll, I'll try to reference that and send that out to the group, um, and maybe that can will be helpful in answering that question. I, I have one question about uh, when we're teaching people about um, heavy metals and soils. So the correlation of having higher heavy metals in soils to other soil quality factors that would eliminate your use of that soil anyway. So thinking about if a soil already has high enough levels of heavy metals or lead that some of the other soil quality factors are going to be limiting anyway that would, you know, be able to rule that out so you would have to move on to one of these, you know, raised beds, soil excavation strategies. 
Definitely. I think that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of parallels with human health, not just soil health. Um, I think the main thing to keep in mind here is acute versus chronic. So you may not see visible effects or a compromising of soil quality or health at concentrations that would be harmful to microbes or to humans. So for example, a couple hundred ppm. Uh, in contrast, I think that an acute dose would definitely have detrimental effects on soil quality um, and also, of course, on humans. And we know that at certain doses, you know, typically the high hundreds of even things like copper, which people spray all the time, uh, that there is a direct negative effect on soil functions like microbial turnover of organic matter um, and potentially on crop growth. Now, that is typically short lived if that pulse of copper is not persistent. So if it's just one burst, um, microbes can recover. When it comes to lead and other heavy metals, I don't think enough is known about how heavy metal buildup compromises soil quality. There's lots of studies showing at or looking at microbes as sensitive indicators. So the amount and the kind of microbes, the activity of the enzymes that they're secreting, they're all sensitive. But one thing is sensitivity of a measurement. Another is, does that translate to a change in function? So how well can the organic matter be mineralized to provide nutrients for your crop? That, I think, is an open question. Um, so to summarize, Zach, I would say that at very high concentrations, you would likely see a detrimental effect on soil quality. But those are also concentrations that are acutely of high risk to you as a human. There's a space in between the low dose and the acute dose where it might be harder to figure out what's going on for the soil, but you'd be at risk. Well, I also mean in the sense that how do I describe this? In the sense that because we're talking about all these trade-offs and one of these trade-offs with excavating soil or importing raised bed material and, and new compost and soil, there's an economic expense to that. So if you are evaluating your soil and you want to grow in the soil, um, that one of the trade-offs is going through this screening method for heavy metals, but that it could it could be both contaminated, but also even if it was wasn't contaminated and you wanted to use the soil, some of the, the those factors might be limiting, like you know compaction or it's a heavy clay or anthropogenic fill that would preclude you from using that soil anyway. So you would have to use one of these uh, mitigation strategies. I see. Yes, I would agree that there's uh, certain co-benefits in the tactic of compost addition as a way to mitigate heavy metals, but also improving soil quality overall. Also think of the crop choice. It seems like, you know, fruits don't accumulate as much of the heavy metals. And so you might imagine if you're mulching, adding lots of compost uh, and growing fruit crops, that might be a way of making use of urban lots that have, you know, higher amounts of lead in surface soils. Okay, excellent. And just one last thing, and we'll we'll end this here, uh, is the because I hadn't thought about the windblown uh, recontamination of raised beds. So, what do you think about the idea of multifunctional landscape design, where you're incorporating windbreaks and physical barriers from preventing windblown contaminants getting on the site as a way to mitigate some of that recontamination? I think that that's a great idea. And in fact, there's evidence from papers showing that trees act as um, they effectively drop the dust out of the air, they capture it, and you tend to get a lot of lead building up at the base of trees in these urban uh, zones. And so you could use that to your advantage by building this explicit wind block that would be a way to capture lead deposition before it would get to a growing site. And you might imagine that there's wind patterns and proximity and location of nearby traffic ways that could be accounted for when designing these landscapes. Awesome. Well, th well, thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Margnat one more time uh, for this fabulous presentation and sharing this expertise and our future research program in, in this very misunderstood area of soil systems, particularly in urban and para-urban environments. I also want to thank everyone for joining us and sticking with us for some of this exchange at the end. Uh, hopefully you can use some of this information for your future projects or current projects this year. Look for an email uh, for, from, from me for the archived webinar on our YouTube channel as well as the short evaluation for feedback for this webinar to help us shape future webinars and possibly uh, future research projects. So uh, have a fabulous day and a productive start to the, the rest of your...